Hello, everyone, and welcome to week five of the seminar. It's hard to believe that the quarter is just flying by, but here we are with another excellent presentation for you. And before I introduce our speaker, I'll just uh, ground us again in our familiar conceptual frameworks for food systems as we continue our exploration of food supply chains within that context. Um, this week, we're back at the mostly regional scale of production, but of course, um, with also a national and international perspective on the food supply chain of our topic today, which is potatoes. Um, on the left, of course, is the FAO diagram that we've been working, working with all quarter. And um, a reminder that while we focus on the food supply chain, we're also taking into account and considering the drivers of that food supply chain and the implications throughout the food system, including ultimately for nutrition and health outcomes. On the right, we have our Nourish Food System map. And that's a reminder that while the food supply chain is often depicted in a linear representation, it's really a system of systems, you know, and it's really cyclical and interconnected and, um, and interrelated. And so while we're gonna be hearing about production, we'll also be hearing about distribution, which is of course impacted by politics and economics. And as we know now, public health as well. Um, in addition to the other systems that are listed here. So uh, last slide before I introduce our speaker, just a reminder that this week, as with every week until the last one, Nutrition 400 students will have an opportunity to submit your reflections. And just to be one more time really clear about this, you only need to submit five um, we'll only grade five out of the eight reflection opportunities, but you're welcome to submit more if you want. And a reminder that you need 75% in the course to get the credit. Um, also a reminder to our Nutrition 500 students and also to the 400 students that the final assignment, uh, which is due during exam week, will be posted next week. And um, Nutrition 500 students, that will also give you, uh, you'll also get some detail on that final synthesis of our seminar series at that time. More information to come on Canvas. And now, the reason we are all here, we will turn our attention to talking about impacts to the potato supply chain due to COVID-19. And I'm so pleased that we have the executive director from the Washington State Potato Commission with us today. And so I'm so pleased to introduce Chris Voigt. Um, and I'll, Chris, I'll just read your bio before I turn this over to you. And I hope you all have a chance to look at Chris's full bio um, on Canvas because he, he details uh, a, an interesting experiment <laughs> that was from 10 years ago now, though you probably won't have time to talk about too much, but where he, um, participated in a, a 60 day period of eating potatoes in order to bring some attention to the nutritional value of potatoes as well. And so um, beyond that, you know, his day job is with the Washington State Potato Commission where he focuses on managing potato research, opening new international markets and working on legislative and regulatory issues. So Chris, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to you. We are so pleased that you can be with us today and be here as part of the seminar. Thank you so much for your time and for coming to share your expertise. Well, thanks so much for having me. And we'll uh, see if I can get this going here. All right. Um, so I really kind of want to focus on, you know, ultimately we want to talk about what the impacts of the uh, potato supply chain due to COVID was uh, for our potato growers and our potato supply chains here in the state. Uh, but before I do that, I think you have to have an understanding of, of kind of what our supply system looks like, uh, why we're a little bit unique compared to other potato growing regions and, uh, and kind of why potatoes are sort of a big deal not only here in Washington state because of the economic impact, but globally and why potatoes are gonna become even more and more important as we, we go forward. So without further ado, uh, let me give you kind of an introduction to what a potato commission is. So a potato commission is one of several commodity commissions, agricultural commodity commissions located here in Washington state. These are all self-funded organizations. Essentially, the producers, all the potato growers, went to the legislature back in 1956 and said, hey, state legislature, we want you to create an organization that essentially will help us do the things 
for us and our farms and our industry that we can't do for ourselves. You know, I don't have enough money to pay for my own entomologist and potato breeder, but if I can kick in a little bit of money and all the potato growers do that, then we can pay for research together or we can jointly promote Washington potatoes in Chicago. So it was all about doing things collectively that an individual farmer couldn't do for themselves. And so the legislature came, created the Potato Commission, and really the only role the government has with the Potato Commission is mandatory taxing authority. So our growers do have to pay mandatorily four cents to us for every 100 pounds of potatoes that they grow. We combine those four cents together and it works out to about $3.8 million for a budget that we have. And so our focus is um, research, you know, trying to figure out how to breed the next potato. And, and it's usually all done through conventional breeding. We, not that we're opposed to genetic engineering, it's just there's no consumer acceptance of that for potatoes. And so we, we're only gonna grow what consumers want. And so right now it's, it's not GM potatoes. Um, so we're conventionally breeding potatoes. We're trying to figure out how to grow more potatoes using fewer resources, finding varieties that will do that, how to control pests, how to increase the uh, nutrition content, how to do better job of cooking them. So that's where we focus our research on. Uh, we do spend a little bit of time on marketing and promotions, not a lot, uh, mostly because of what we grow. We're not necessarily branding Washington potatoes a lot like Idaho does, for example, mostly because 90% of what we grow here in Washington is actually more of an ingredient. It's going to be turned into a processed product. And so it's really kind of difficult to brand that. It's not like McDonald's is going to put a Washington potato logo on their container, right? Uh, and then the other thing, the important thing that we do is we're the voice of the potato industry, uh, both in Olympia and Washington, D.C. So we're, we're uh, working on governmental affairs, both the regulatory and uh, legislative. Uh, pieces of that. So that's how the Potato Commission works, and that's how um, all the other commodity commissions within Washington State work. So there's a Grains Commission, a Hop Commission, a Tree uh, Apple Commission, and so forth. So here's our humble little office. We're located in the heart of potato growing region in Washington State, uh, which is the Columbia Basin is the biggest part. I don't know if you've ever driven I-90, like going towards Spokane or Montana. Uh, as soon as you cross the Columbia River, there's a sign shortly after that that says, you know, welcome to Grant County, the largest potato, potato producing county in the country. And that's us. So our office is in Moses Lake, which is Grant County. And that's our little uh, potato mobile that we like to drive around. All right, so just some stats on potato production here in Washington State. We grow roughly anywhere between 165 and 170,000 acres of potatoes. Um, and the primary growing regions we have are the Columbia Basin, which is kind of at central Washington, kind of from like Moses Lake on sort of the north end down to like the Tri-Cities, Pasco, Kenwick, Richland area. Uh, that's the primary growing region, roughly about 90% of all the potatoes in Washington state are grown there in that area. And then north of Seattle, north of uh, University of Washington is the Skagit Valley. Uh, and that's where about 10% of the potatoes are grown. And those potatoes up there are mostly like the red potatoes or yellow potato, like a Yukon gold. Whereas the Columbia Basin is gonna be more of the brown, like russet type potato, like a baking potato that you would find in the grocery store. Uh, so what I, so I mentioned earlier, what's kind of unique about Washington State is about 90% of what we grow is gonna be processed. Uh, most of that into frozen French fries, but it could also be hash browns, hash brown patties, tater tots, instant mashed potatoes, scalloped dehydrated potatoes, those types of things. And another thing that's important about us is because we're so close to the ocean and the deep ports of Seattle and Tacoma, we're a huge um, area for destined for exports. So we export roughly about 70% of our potato and potato products, uh, mostly headed to the Pacific Rim, uh, Japan being our number one customer. And because of all this uh, value added processing that we do and exports, uh, the economic value of potato production here in Washington State, uh, uh, we, we generate roughly about seven and a half billion dollars in economic activity just because of growing and processing and selling potatoes here in the state. Uh, and there's this 36,000 jobs associated with that. So potatoes are actually kind of a big deal here in the state. Uh, a little bit about nutrition. I don't know if you know this. I mean, I think everybody eats potatoes, right? But nobody really thinks about what's in them. Um, there's actually more potassium in a potato than a banana. So all of you athletes, if you're uh, worried about your muscles and, and uh, about cramping afterwards, um, eat a potato rather than banana, about 40 to 50% more potassium in a potato than a banana. 
Um, very nutrient dense, lots of uh, uh, vitamins and minerals uh, throughout the potato. Almost half of your recommended daily allowance of vitamin C is in a potato. You don't really, you, know, you think about oranges and lemons and limes for vitamin C, you don't necessarily think about potatoes, uh, but a, a good amount of that. High in fiber um, and a great energy source. Those carbohydrates, not only for good mental energy, but then also for good physical activity. Uh, so a great uh, a product to eat uh, before you work out as well as you after you work out for muscle recovery. And then you got to recognize the things that aren't in a potato that make it healthy. There's no cholesterol in a potato. There's no fat in a potato. There's no sodium in a potato. So potatoes, surprisingly to a lot of people, are actually pretty nutritious. And um, so it's got a nutrition profile. Now, what about kind of from a sustainability standpoint? I think in, in China is actually kind of on the cutting edge of this. Actually, China is investing a huge amount of money in potato research because they recognize that potatoes are, are actually probably the best and cheapest, most sustainable way of delivering food and nutrition to their population than other grain products. Uh, so the four biggest crops grown in the world are, are rice, corn, wheat, and potatoes. Uh, rice is by far number one uh, globally, is the number one crop produced. Uh, it's a staple for many cultures. Uh, and then potatoes are the number four crop in, in, the, in the world. But here's the thing about potatoes, uh, and, and I'm going to pick on rice. Uh, so comparing rice, and so I, I did kind of the web searches, and I looked at you know the, the two primary growing regions for rice in, in the U.S. are California and then also Louisiana. So I'm comparing potatoes to rice production in California. Uh, so you, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but you can actually produce four times the amount of food per acre of ground growing potatoes than you can rice. And that's just looking at calories. So you can produce four times the amount of calories growing potatoes than you can rice. Again, why China is interested in this from a land use perspective, you know, you can grow just as much food with four times less land growing potatoes than you could rice. And so that's very attractive to a lot of countries from a sustainability standpoint. Uh, and then also, if you look at the number one input of a crop, which is usually nitrogen, whether it's an organic source of nitrogen through like a manure type fertilizer, or whether it's a synthetic fertilizer, you know, where they take the nitrogen air or nitrogen out of the air and compress it into little pellets, um, using a, a lot of energy to do that, that's synthetic nitrogen, uh, you can actually get 100% or twice as much food growing potatoes per unit of nitrogen than you can rice. So from an input perspective, it also makes it a very sustainable uh, product. And then water use. Water is always critical uh, in the production of food, and you can um, grow potatoes um, with 90% less water than you can rice. So really, uh, potato production is, is highly sustainable because of the, the nutrient dense quality of our product, as well as this, the ability to produce a lot of calories using fewer inputs, less land and less water. So it makes it a very attractive crop. So I, you know, um, I am gonna touch a little bit on this crazy potato diet that I did. So literally I ate nothing but potatoes for 60 days. And it just worked out to be 20 potatoes a day for 60 days. And it literally was just potatoes. So there was um, no butter, no sour cream, no gravy, no salsa, no toppings, nothing else with it. But I did allow myself some seasonings, you know, salt, pepper, thyme, oregano, chives, uh, and a little bit of oil for cooking. Uh, just because, like I said, there was no fat in a potato and your body, you know, needs those essential fatty acids. And so it sounds weird to say it out loud, but I had to add French fries and potato chips to make my diet healthier so I could get those essential fatty acids. Uh, and then for beverages during those 60 days, really mostly just water, but, you know, occasionally black coffee or black plain tea or, or maybe an occasional diet soda, but nothing that really added much nutrition. So here's the nutrition you get from eating 20 potatoes a day, which works out to about 2,200 calories. And that's, um, you know, I kind of did one of those calorie calculators and that, and I wasn't trying to lose weight or gain weight. I just want to, wanted to maintain my weight. And I said, a guy my size, my activity level, 2,200 calories is, is what I typically burn. So 2,200 calories of potatoes uh, generates 942% uh, of the recommended daily allowance of vitamin C. 423% of the recommended daily allowance for B, vitamin B6, potassium 345%. So you can see kind of the long laundry list of nutritional items that were in potatoes. So that's what I was gonna be getting from eating just potatoes. Now you get down towards the bottom of the list. And, and I recognize, you know, this diet wasn't to 
create the next fad diet, what I was trying to do is really just prove a point that there is a tremendous amount of food in a potato and that there literally is so much nutrition in a potato that you could literally live off of just potatoes for at least 60 days anyways, without any detrimental impact your health. At least that's what I was hoping for. I didn't really know because no one had really ever done this before. Uh, but the great thing about um, you know the vitamin A and, and E uh, de deficiency or there's none in a potato, uh, those are fat soluble vitamins. And so your body kind of has a healthy supply of that. So as long as you're burning through fat, sat, fat cells, you'll, you'll kind of release those. And so at the end of 60 days, I'm, I'm not gonna exhibit any, any uh, deficiencies in those vitamins. Uh, so this is kind of what I typically ate. Uh, this was uh, purple mashed potatoes. When I say mashed, it literally was just mashed potatoes. It wasn't like butter or sour cream or, or milk was added to these. And uh, these are roasted red uh, potatoes. Uh, these were just fried sliced uh, yellow potatoes. These were boiled or steamed potatoes uh, with a little uh, Tabasco sauce sprinkled on them. Um, there's no nutrition in Tabasco sauce. These were just boiled potatoes. These were just, again, mashed up potatoes with different seasonings on it. So that's uh, kind of typically what I ate uh, for 60 days. And unfortunately, I, I started like October 1st and you count 60 days past that and it goes into Thanksgiving. And that's like the greatest eating fest our country has, right? Uh, but I was stuck with just potatoes. But to kind of, you know, make it interesting, I took five pounds of Yukon gold mashed potatoes, shaped it into the form of a turkey and like brushed it with a little oil and put it under the broiler to kind of crisp it up a little bit. And, uh, and that's what I had. And then here's my pumpkin pie. Again, mashed potatoes with some orange food coloring and pumpkin pie spice spices added to it. Um, actually, the turkey wasn't too bad. I mean, it was probably the most tender potato turkey I've ever had. Uh, the pie, yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. Pumpkin pie seasoning with mashed potatoes just didn't quite cut it. But here's the thing. So I did the, a diet, or I did a physical uh, at the start of the diet, at the end of the diet. Look at what happened. And I, I wasn't out to lose weight, remember, but I did end up losing 21 pounds, even though I was eating 2,200 calories a day. Cholesterol dropped 67 points. Blood sugar came down 10%. My triglycerides or the fat content in your blood uh, came down significantly. So literally, and then all the other health indicators, protein, calcium, iron, they either stayed the same or improved. So literally, I got healthier eating just potatoes for 60 days straight. Now, I, again, I wouldn't recommend this. I mean, at some point, I probably would exhibit, uh, you know, a vitamin A deficiency. Uh, who knows when that would have happened. But again, I wasn't trying to create the next fad diet. I wasn't encouraging people to do this. I was just trying to make a bold state. So about that, there is a lot of nutrition in potatoes. And if I did this back in 2010, and it kind of went viral for 2010, and, and so ended up on, on um, the Today Show, and Fox, and Bloomberg, Anderson Cooper, on CNN, uh, MSNBC, uh, Good Morning America, and so it did kind of go viral, uh, just because nobody had ever done that before, and it attracted a lot of attention about how much nutrition there really was in a potato. Okay, so let's get back to kind of the normal flow of potatoes and the, and the food system, and that's really what we're here to talk about. So potatoes in Washington state, we typically plant potatoes in March and April, and then we start harvesting them throughout the summer. So we start harvesting them roughly about that first or second week in July and through September. And all those potatoes that we harvest in July, August, and about midway through September, those are directly delivered to potato processors like French fry manufacturers or packing sheds, and they're washing them and sorting them, putting them in bags and getting them out to the grocery stores. So they literally go from the field um, to a, either a processor or a fresh packer when they're harvested during the summer. And those are our early season potatoes. Those are the ones that mature the earliest and those are the ones that we harvest the soonest. Now our later maturing potatoes, these are the ones that we're actually gonna hold in storage and use them for the rest of the year. So the potatoes that are harvested kind of that second half of September and all of October, they're going into storage. And then those are the potatoes that we're going to pull out in November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June, and use those then um, until the new crop is ready. And so that's kind of the normal flow of potatoes. And here's what a potato harvester looks like. Um, it is a machine that's pulled by a tractor or it could be self-propelled. And it just kind of scoops up the potatoes out of the ground. This is actually a potato field where the vines have been killed. And uh, so the dead vines are there and now we're just going through and this blade is going through and kind of picking the potatoes up out of the ground. 
and uh, kind of shaking out the dirt and the rocks and loading them into a truck. And then that truck is going to go, um, again, if this is a summer, it's gonna go directly to a French fry manufacturer or packing shed, or if these are gonna go into storage, they'll go into storage. And here's kind of what the inside of a potato storage looks like. And this is kind of a smaller one. Um, this is, uh, they're usually buildings about the size of a football field, so pretty big. And they've got these tubes, so it's like a concrete floor, and they've got these tubes on the ground, these culvert tubes that cool air and humidity are, are pumped uh, with. Uh, and the, the potatoes are just kind of stacked up on top of these tubes, and it's literally stacked high about 15 feet. And so imagine a room the size of a football field, potatoes 15 feet high. And so that's what today's modern potato storages look like. And you, you know, when a potato goes in there, you know, the 1st of October, you can pull it out of storage in, let's say, June, and it is just the same quality. It's still a really, really good potato. And so uh, these are highly insulated buildings, very energy efficient. And as long as you keep the potatoes dark, you keep them cool, and you keep humidity going through there, and there's not a lot of disease or anything in there, the potatoes can store for about a year. Uh, so we take those potatoes and we make uh, simple things like french fries. So remember, french fries are pretty simple, uh, a relatively low processed product. You're literally just slicing the potatoes into french fry pieces, uh, partially cooking them in oil, uh, and then freezing them. And then uh, they're shipped out to uh, different uh, restaurants, and that's where they essentially reheat them or, or finish the cooking, the second half of the cooking in, in oil or uh, ovens or so forth. And um, so you've got uh, regular uh, shoestring French fries, you got curly, curly fries, and you got waffle fries. Um, and then uh, here's uh, my my uh, probably the biggest uh, tater tot consumer we have, Napoleon Dynamite. I don't know if you know the story about tater tots. Tater tots uh, were kind of created in the like the late fifties, kind of the nineteen fifties, early sixties when we were making French fries. If you take a potato and you you run it through a French fry cutter. Like on the outside edges, sometimes they're like slivers or smaller pieces. Nobody wants, you know, small pieces of French fries. You like the long ones, right? And so it used to be we would literally throw those away because there was really not a market for them or there was broken pieces. And so we ended up just tossing those away. Well, someone said, and it was actually the Orida guy, he said, um, why, why waste all this stuff? Why don't we kind of grind it up and then kind of make it into a preformed product and that's where the tater tot came from. So literally tater tots are made from either small pieces of French fries or broken pieces and that's where tater tots come from. So we literally have, have gone almost to zero waste when it comes to potato products and potatoes. So that's really great news. The only waste product that we have are some of the peelings and even more and more French fries are actually being um, eaten with the peels on. But for those, um, like for example, McDonald's doesn't have a, a peel on French fry. Uh, we peel those, but instead of uh, putting them in a landfill, we're actually uh, feeding them, feeding them to livestock like cows and dairy animals. So literally there's almost zero waste when it comes to potatoes. So again, it makes it a really highly um, sustainable crop with, with very, very, very little food waste. Uh, another product that's made, uh, instant mashed potatoes. You know, people will think of them as not real potatoes, but they literally are. Uh, I'll have to show you the video sometimes of it where you can, it's literally you make mashed potatoes and then you just suck the moisture out and it comes up with kind of this dry powder here. Uh, this is instant mashed potatoes. So they're, they're really real mashed potatoes. I mean, some people call them fake mashed potatoes or fake potatoes, but they're actually real potatoes, just the water taken out. Okay, so who eats potatoes? So this is um, kind of a demographic chart that marketers like to look at. They wanna know, who, you know who's eating your product. And so this is the number of times that you'll eat potatoes at home in, in your household. So, and this is kind of a, kind of the life cycle. Um, so you start out here, you're, you're single, you're young, uh, maybe you get married, you have kids through here, kids leave, you're empty nesters, you get old and eventually you die, right? So this is kind of our demographic chart. So um, when you guys graduate from the University of Washington, you're likely, you're gonna have hopefully a nice job that, that pays a decent salary or wage, and you're gonna be an affluent single. So you're making money, uh, but guess what? You're our worst potato eater at home. You know why? Because you're just, you're not cooking much. You're going out to eat a lot. Maybe you're eating potatoes out at restaurants, but you're not eating them at home only 22 times a year. Now, if you're a lower to middle income single, you're actually eating potatoes more because, well, you don't have as much money to go out and eat quite so often. Uh, so you're doing more cooking at home. So you're, you're making potatoes and potatoes are cheap, cheap nutrition. 
Uh, now here's a dink. I don't know if anybody knows what a dink is, but that stands for, it's a marketing term. Uh, dual income, no kids. So all of a sudden now there's two of you in your household. You're not single anymore. So what that means is you're actually cooking more. Um, you're cooking more than when you were single. And so anytime you cook at home, you're, you're more likely to have potatoes. So your consumption goes up to 63 times. Uh, and then here, these are all kids, households with children. So whether you're, both parents are working or you're a single parent working or you're an affluent family, but traditional family where, you know, maybe it's the dad that works, mom stays at home, or maybe you're a lower middle income traditional family. They're by far our best consumers. Uh, they eat a lot of potatoes or doing a lot of cooking at home, not eating out a lot. Potatoes are inexpensive. And so those are our best customers. But then once the kids leave the house, uh, your potato consumption drops off. And again, it's because you're not necessarily doing a lot of cooking at home. So that's what's happening at home. So now the potato market is specifically for Washington State. So we grow roughly about 10 billion pounds of potatoes every year. Uh, and 9 billion of that is processed into potato products. Like I said, French fries, hash browns, tater tots, instant mashed potatoes, dehyde scalp potatoes, like you know the boxes of scalp potatoes you would find, those types of products. So 9 billion pounds of the 10 are for uh, processed products. And only 1 billion pounds is for the fresh market. So um, when, and when I say fresh market, that's what shows up in the grocery stores. Those are the baked potatoes delivered to restaurants. So those are the fresh potatoes, not processed potatoes. But now here's some interesting statistics that I want you to pay really close attention to. And that's about food service, because that's where we had the biggest COVID impacts was in food service. So 90% of all the processed potato products, all the French fries, tater tots, hash browns that you eat, happen in a food service establishment, whether it's a school cafeteria, whether it's McDonald's, whether it's a sit down restaurant, you know, where, whatever type of food service it is, 90% of your French fry consumption is happening in food service, only 10% at home. Remember that number. The fresh potatoes, it's evenly split. About half the fresh potatoes are eaten in a restaurant and half the fresh potatoes are, are come from the grocery store that you buy and, and you eat them at home. Okay, so now pre-COVID, I mean, literally like March 1st, or uh, it's kind of the, my timeline I'm looking at here, things were awesome. It was red hot demand for frozen potato products uh, because of things like McDonald's all day breakfast. So maybe you wouldn't go to McDonald's for dinner, but hey, I'm having a hankering for breakfast at dinner. So I, I'm gonna go now. So you weren't a customer for McDonald's at dinner, but now you're going there because of the all day breakfast. Well, guess what? Hash Browns patties comes with those. and so. The demand for hash brown patties went up. Uh, nacho fries at Taco Bell went up. And actually, nacho, uh, nacho fries isn't always on the menu at Taco Bell just because we couldn't keep up with the demand for it. Um, and then everybody had like their fully loaded fries. Like Wendy's had like fries with chili and cheese on it, right? And all sorts of restaurants were coming up with that. And poutine got to be really popular. So French fry demand was really off the charts. And even internationally, the international growth for frozen potato products or processed products was up six to seven percent every year. Remember I talked about how we export roughly about 70 percent of what we grow. Uh, so that international growth was just it was a red hot market for all, all of us. And actually our international customers, we had to put on rations or quotas because we couldn't meet their needs. We'd say, well, we can only ship you about 80 percent of what you need. You're going to have to go somewhere else to find that just because we, we couldn't grow enough potatoes. See, we're kind of landlocked. Potatoes, when you grow potatoes, you can only grow potatoes once every four years. If you grow on a piece of ground, if you grow them more than that, then the kind of the different funguses and bacteria build up in the potato fields and that'll kill your potatoes. And so you have to let the ground, you have to grow other crops that aren't gonna facilitate um, those, those diseases. And so, so for every ground of uh, potatoes, you, every acre of potatoes you have, you have to have like three acres in reserve. And so that kind of limits the amount of, of acreage that we can use for potatoes. So we really are maxed out at about 170,000 acres of potatoes. I mean, the only way we could increase that was if we could, you know, we're investing heavily in soil health research to see if we can do a better job of, of 
you know, finding different rotations or cover crops that can manage those diseases for us. So maybe instead of growing potatoes once every four years on a piece of ground, we could do it maybe every once every three years. So that would help us. That's almost like increasing your supply of potatoes by five uh, by 25% if you can, can grow potatoes once every three years instead of once every four years. And then, you know, looking at additional irrigation ground, you know, could we get more, a little more water out of the Columbia River and get it to some ground that's not currently irrigated. So we were trying to figure out how to get more potato production. Um, and then the uh, fresh market. I mean, everybody was loving potatoes. Every, it was going great, awesome. And then COVID, the pandemic. So we started planting, you know, so the pandemic was brewing. The COVID virus, uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19 was here in Washington state. Um, and it was kind of percolating around and we started planting potatoes about, you know, March 10th is when we started. And planting will go up until, you know, actually towards the end of April, depending on where you're at in the state. Uh, but it was about, um, uh, this was the big pivotal date was March 13th. And that's where they announced the schools were gonna go online. And I think people saw the handwriting on the wall and they determined, ooh, I better get to the grocery store because yeah, schools are going online. There might be a time where they're just gonna shut everything down, even grocery stores, so I gotta go stock up. And so that's when it got crazy, when everybody was hoarding. And literally, that is the first time, and I'm 55 years old, that's the first time in my life I've ever seen bare shelves. I mean, we have, a, we, if you've ever gone to third world countries, bare shelves are a pretty common occurrence just because the food systems there aren't as mature and developed and as awesome as what we have here. So in my 55 years, our food system has always met my needs. Uh, the, the supply chain has always been there. Um, and, and it was weird to walk in the grocery store and see all the canned foods gone, all the dehydrated potatoes products gone, all the fresh potatoes gone. The meat case was empty. The freezer cases were bare. Toilet paper was in short supply. You know, it was crazy. And so uh, that's where it got a little crazy for us. Um, you know, and then um, just the timeline continues. Uh, March 19th is when California issued their kind of shutdown. Uh, um, and then when that happened, literally the next day our processors went to the growers who were planting and said, stop, stop, don't plant any more potatoes because we don't know how long all these restaurants are gonna be closed. This could affect demand. And, and we still got potatoes in storage that we haven't used yet. And, and, and we, we just, just put a hold on things. And then four days went by and then that's when they issued cuts. They said, okay, things have gotten crazy. We're doing cuts. Anybody who is growing early season potatoes, the potatoes that we harvest in July and August, you guys are cut. We're either cutting you 100% or 50% because we're still think we've got a lot of potatoes in storage that we're going to have to use up. Normally we use up those potatoes by, you know, the 4th of July for the new crop to come on. But obviously we're going to have leftover potatoes from the old crop. So don't plant any more of the early season potatoes. Uh, and then officially Washington went into their stay home, stay, stay safe on March 26th. And then literally we were told on April 14th, that we had 1 billion pounds of potatoes extra in storage. So on April 1st, we literally had 4 billion pounds of, in storage and the processors and fresh packing said, okay, we think we can use one, 3 billion pounds of that. So three fourths of it, but there's 1 billion pounds that we're just not gonna find a home for. I mean, start, start doing whatever you can to get rid of them. Now, 1 billion pounds. Uh, so essentially, so it was crazy, but first of all, you know, before I talk about that extra billion pounds, we've got to talk about some of the immediate actions that had to happen. You know, when restaurants shut down, all of a sudden we had, how do you shift all that food business from restaurants? And, and, and literally we were spending as consumers, the average consumer was spending half of their food dollar in restaurants and half at home. Now, all of a sudden we shut down the restaurants um, and it's like, ooh, how do we shift all that business to home? And so right away, we had to go to work. Well, first of all, we, we had to make sure that uh, farmers and people working in the food business could be declared essential workers. And so we needed the governor's office to make that declaration so that we could continue to go to work to make sure that we could get potatoes to grocery stores that we can you know get french fries to grocery stores. So we had to have that done. We had to make sure our workers were safe. We had to get them personal protective equipment, uh, make sure that we were able to socially distance properly and, and thank goodness and potato production is highly mechanized. You know, those harvesters don't really require anybody but a couple people. Tractors only require one person. Uh, packing sheds are, are very highly automated. And so we don't have a lot of employees. We do have some and we had to make sure that they were protected. And then things like labeling. You know, we had 
so much. You know, like I said, 90% of our fresh fries are devoted towards food service. If you've ever seen food service packaging, it's minimal. It's literally a brown paper bag, five of them, five five pound bags, paper bags filled with French fries, put into a, a, a brown box with the label, you know, French fries on it, blah, blah, blah. No nutritional labeling, nothing like that. So how do you convert all that that you have in food service packaging to retail to make sure that retailers have French fries on, in, in their freezer cases because supplies were short. And so we actually had to get temporary suspension of some of the labeling requirements just so that we could transfer whatever was in the food service channel to retail quickly. Um, and then even some of the truck driving rules, we had to have them suspended to make sure that um, our truck drivers could work longer hours to make sure that they could keep the food supply going. So there were immediate things that had to happen when we had to transition so quickly uh, from food service to retail sales. So like I said, um, here's, here's the biggest constraint that we ran across that we for French fry, which is, like I said, 90% of our business of what we grow is processed potato products. And 90% of all French fry consumption happens in a restaurant. So when we shut down the restaurants, huge implications to, to our industry. So here's, here's the big take home message is that, so you would think, I mean, a, a rational person would think, well, I'm, I'm eating the same amount of food, right? So instead of eating in the restaurant, I'm just gonna eat it at home. So it should be a, tra a smooth transition and shouldn't affect anything, right? So the French fries that I normally ate in a restaurant, I'm now gonna eat home. Well, guess what? Your consumer behavior is very different at home than what it is in a restaurant. When you go to a restaurant, um, you're more likely to eat a potato product. You're more likely to bake a potato because it takes an hour. You're more likely to have French fries. Whereas at home, and I'm a good example, I don't necessarily eat French fries all that regularly. So like, for example, if I went to a restaurant and had a sandwich, I'd get the fries that came with it, right? If I make a sandwich at home, now that I'm working at home and I want walk into the kitchen to make my lunch, I'm probably not going to turn on the oven or get the deep fryer out to make an order of fries to go with my sandwich. I'm not, I'm just gonna have the sandwich. And so our behavior is very different. So French fry consumption dropped off significantly. We're gonna come back to that, but now I wanna talk about that extra billion pounds of potatoes. What do you do with that? So, so April 14th is when we were told that we had an extra billion pounds. So we've got to empty out our potato storages. We have from April 14th until that new crop comes on in July. So it is at like three months, essentially, to get rid of a billion pounds of potatoes. To get rid of a billion pounds of potatoes, you need 20,000 semi-trucks, 20,000. And you need 20,000 semi-truck drivers. How do you do that in three months? And normally, you know, could, could there be, and these were all processed potato products. I mean, these were all potatoes that were going to be made into french fries that were not anymore. And so can you convert that into put them in bags and sell them in grocery stores? Well, our packing sheds, we have roughly about 20 potato packing sheds that are taking the potatoes, washing them, grating them, sorting them, putting them in bags or boxes and sending them to grocery stores, right? Or restaurants. So now we've got, we on a normal year, we package a billion pounds of fresh potatoes. So from July 10th, until you know a year later, it takes us a year to, to wash and grade and package a billion pounds. So now <laughs> we, we all of a sudden throw another whole billion pounds. So essentially doubling how much we have to pack in a year, but you gotta do it in like three months. And so just logistically, it was really hard to do. And so then we, we said, well, what are we gonna do with a billion pounds? So we literally started giving them away to really anybody. And we, we loaded up the food banks. We literally, um, we made a goal of, of us as a potato commission, giving away 2 billion pounds of, of potatoes. We actually started out at 1 billion and then bumped it up to 2 billion pounds because we saw such a need for it. Uh, so we did 12 big potato giveaway events. We were at the Tacoma Dome. We were up in Bellingham. We were in Auburn. We were in Vancouver, Spokane, Moses Lake the Tri-Cities, kind of spreading it out all over the state and then plus loading up food banks. But, you know, free potatoes, growers have free potatoes to give away, but free potatoes aren't free. I mean, even though someone says, come and get them, well, you still got to pay for the transportation. You still got to pay for the washing. You still got to pay for the packaging and, and someone to wash them and package them. And so roughly it costs about, even if someone has free potatoes, it costs roughly about $50,000 to wash and package 
and, and transport in state uh, uh, about a million pounds of potatoes. And so we raised through a GoFundMe site. I mean, people were great about wanting to help out and to pay for the, the washing and packaging of these donated potatoes and getting them out to food banks. And so we raised $60,000 um, and then we, we paid for it. Um, the potato growers kicked in another 40,000 to do that. So we got out about 2 million pounds of potatoes and we literally flooded the food banks. But here's the thing. The max, I mean, they predicted, they expected about 2 million people to access the food banks in Washington state during the peak of the pandemic. <laughs> so that would mean to, to put a billion pounds of potato in perspective, that is literally 500 pounds of potatoes for every man, woman, and child that goes to a food bank uh, that they have to eat between April 14th and you know July 5th. <laughs> And is that going to happen? No. I mean, our food banks were literally flooded with free potatoes. And, and so it, it got tough. And so we ended up, um, thankfully, things changed a little bit. So as soon as, you know, drive-in restaurants, you know, McDonald's, anybody, a restaurant that had drive-in or takeout opened up, things turned around a little bit. It certainly didn't return to normal. But our potato processors came back to us on, on May 7th and said, okay, we we, we think now it's only about uh, a half a billion pounds that we're gonna get rid of. I think we'll be able to take that extra, you know, when we told you it was gonna be a billion pounds, we think it's only half a billion pounds now or 500 million pounds um, that um, is, it doesn't have a home for. And so that, that shrunk the pile in half that we had to get rid of. But still remember, we worked hard to give away 2 million pounds and we still had another 498 million pounds to get rid of. So we were doing everything. We were, you know, donating them to anybody who would take them, feeding a lot to livestock. Um, there was actually, a, thank, thankfully, there was a potato uh, harvest crisis in um, some of the Midwest states, and they were really short on potatoes and potato products. So some of our growers were able to sell them really like pennies on a dollar, essentially, putting them on trucks or trains and getting them out to the Midwest. Uh, so our growers lost a lot of money on, on the crop that was in storage. Um, and then June 22nd, um, the, the potato processors officially bought back about 200 million pounds. And so it, it was a tough time. And there were definitely some logistical challenges. So uh, what was the market like during COVID um, and even today? So grocery store sales are up um, pretty much across the board, 15% uh, for fresh potatoes, as well as 15% roughly for processed potatoes like French fries and hash brown patties. So retail sales are up and that's great news because for a long time, retail sales have been kind of at a plateau. So it was nice to see potato being sold in grocery stores, taking them at home and, and eating at home. The food service is down 25% still. And that hurts, um, uh, but you know, but those that have drive-through restaurants or her perfected takeout, they're actually doing okay. Actually, McDonald's is back to pre-pandemic levels, and so that aspect is good. But a lot of the sit-down restaurants, you know, are still really hurting pretty bad. Our, our exports are still down, and that's hit and miss. You know, Japan and uh, Korea are, are doing really good actually, uh, but countries like Philippines, which was an important market to it, is doing really bad. So it all depended on how they managed the, the COVID virus or the corona uh, disease, coronavirus. Um, those that managed it well, um, sales are good. Uh, those countries that managed it poorly, sales are bad. Um, and then so, you know, we had to get, you know, a lot of our growers were, were hurting. And so uh, um, I, I do wanna say that about 12% are permanently closed. 12% of all the restaurants in the country are permanently closed due to COVID. And, and because of that loss of food service business, a lot of our growers are literally just hoping to break even. And I'll talk a little bit more specifically about the finances. So um, here's one of my potato growers. I think he was featured in like the uh, Los Angeles Times, maybe Seattle Times too, but he's kind of a smaller grower. It's crazy to think that a, a grower who has um, 390 acres is kind of a smaller grower. Uh, but he is, he has three potato fields. Uh, they reach about 130 acres. And he hopes by growing the 390 acres of potatoes, he wants to make, his goal is to make $150,000 for his family. So that's the equivalent of, you know, husband and wife working each making $75,000. So, you know, a nice, you know, good solid, you know, middle-class upper middle-class income, right? Um, but to do that, he literally, to grow 390 acres, he has to borrow $2 million every year to grow those potatoes. And then when he sells his potatoes, he's able to pay off his loan because it costs roughly about $5,000 to grow an acre of potatoes. Because the, And the average rate of return on your investment, so you 
is actually 7.5%. So you borrow $200,000, uh, you sell your crop and you're gonna make $150,000 for your family. So here was the problem. He had a 50% cut in his acres. So he, but he had already planted the 390 acres that he thought he was supposed to plant. And the processors tell them, well, we're only gonna use half of that. We're only gonna use 190 acres of it. So what does he do with the other 195 acres? He's already spent $2,500 to plant all those acres. And it would, so he's already spent $500,000, or excuse me, yeah, $500,000 on that crop that he no longer has a market for. And it's gonna cost him another $500,000 to keep growing it. So he had to make a tough decision. It's like, do I just cut my losses? Do I cut my losses at $500,000? Or would I risk it, keep growing the crop, keep spending another $500,000 to grow that part of my crop that I don't have a market for and hope and pray that I can sell it when I harvest it. So do I take the $500,000 loss now or do I take a risk? Because it could be worst case scenario, a million dollar loss when you harvest. And so some growers had to make that tough choice. Some of them plowed it up and took that $500,000 loss. Some gambled, you know, a million dollars and took it to the end. And remember, if you have just a $500,000 loss, remember you're only making $150,000 a year. That's literally over three years of income that you've lost in one year. I mean, so it's really devastating for our potato growers. So I'm kind of wrapping things up here because I want to kind of talk about, and, and well, let me talk about kind of what kind of relief we got to our farmers because that was important because every one of our farmers financially hurt it. And so we had to work with the USDA. We had to work with federal government, part of the COVID package, relief packages that were passed through Congress. There were like three different iterations. Um, the first one, I mean, if you were a corn and cotton, you know, if you were a corn and soybean grower, you were great. But once you got into the specialty crops like produce items, fruits and vegetables, it didn't help at all. It wasn't until like the third package, we call it it's the, the coronavirus food assistance program, um, that, that second one or 2.0 finally provided some relief. They provided uh, $750,000 direct payment. So if you lost $500,000, you got a payment from the government for 250,000. So it didn't get you to break even, but at least it got you some relief. And so that's where we left it. So here's how uh, things wrap up. Um, what could we have done differently? Is there a way that we could have managed this? Because quite frankly, I'm, I'm very impressed. I've been to a lot of second and third world countries and I truly believe that we have the best food system possible. We really do. It's highly developed, highly thought of. I mean, I literally, I mean, when I was a kid, I could not walk into a grocery store and buy watermelon 12 months out of the year. You can do that now. You can get fresh cherries. I mean, you can get literally any food item you want 12 months out of the year where that wasn't possible. So we have an extensive food system. So what could we have done differently? And really, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure there was a lot that we could differently. I mean, we could create more capacity more packing sheds, more freezer space, more warehouse space to start stocking up on food. But yeah, remember anytime you increase capacity, remember, because I said we had a billion pounds of potatoes that we had to package, but it usually takes us a year to do that. But now we've got an extra billion we got to get done in three months. The only way to do that is with extra capacity, right? We just, I mean, if we extend the capacity, that's all expensive. I mean, if you're going to double the size of your potato packing, packing plant, but only use half of it, you know, for a regular year. And, and the only other time you're going to use the second half of it is for a pandemic or we're in kind of a crisis situation. That's a lot of money you got to spend on a piece of infrastructure that's going to sit there. So yeah, we could have used more freezer space for frozen french fries. We could have used more packing capacity, even just more loading docks, you know, uh, where trucks could back up. You know, remember we we're talking about 20,000 semi-trucks that we, we had to get to move this crop you know, we gotta get more employees, more trucks and drivers. So yeah, we could increase capacity, but you know, financially, I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense. Could we stockpile more product just to have on hand? Now, some of that we could do, particularly like the dehydrated potato products. And I think um, the state of Washington and the Washington State Department of Agriculture is looking at that as warehousing food, mostly so that we'll always have a, a good stock of food. So if there is another kind of weird crisis, whether it's a natural disaster or another pandemic, we have like an official warehouse of food, which, you know, we probably wouldn't be able to do French fries or fresh potatoes, but we could have dehydrated potato products in there that we could easily kind of fill that gap. And so that's really, I think maybe, maybe we could, you know, 
do things differently by stockpiling a little bit more. But then I think one of the things that we all learned is, is we need extra retail packaging. If you're 90% of your business is food service and only 10% is your retail business, uh, if we ever have to go through a big shift again, probably the cheapest, easiest thing you can do is just have an extra supply of retail packaging because even we, our French fry manufacturers, even if they wanted to package uh, French fries and a nice looking retail consumer bag that you would find in a grocery store, you couldn't even get packaging. There was such a shortage because everybody was transitioning from food service to retail sales. So there was a huge shortage of packing materials and packaging materials. So, so yeah, I, I don't know if you could really do a whole lot different other than maybe stockpiling some of these stuff, shelf stable products, as well as maybe have some extra packaging on hand. So I think that kind of wraps up, but you know, I, I've enjoyed my time with you and talking about this with you, but I, I you know, I look forward to uh, maybe answering some of your questions um, online at a later date. So whatever you got, send it to me. Here's my contact information. And I'd be more than happy to, uh, to try to address some of the questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Chris. And my students have heard me say this already through the quarter, but I wish we were all in the same room so you could hear the applause that would follow your presentation. Um, so you covered so much, you know, and, and I just wanted to acknowledge the incredibly challenging and stressful and in many cases just really life changing and heartbreaking year that it's been for farmers and for so many people who work throughout the food supply chain. So, you know, just to kind of speak to that piece first, but also to say, you know, the whole presentation from start to finish, including how you got healthier eating just potatoes. And uh, thank you for sharing those details and for, for really painting a picture of what it means to grow potatoes, what it means to kind of move potatoes through a supply chain on a normal day, uh, a normal year, and then giving us this uh, hard, hard won, hard earned insights into what the challenges have been in the past year. So. Thank you for that. And I, I think we have time just for um, one question, maybe two. And um, I was really struck, um, you know, with your, like just with the last slide that you were sharing there, you know, as you obviously, as so many people are doing in this year, really reflecting on kind of now that we're almost a year past the, the beginning of this pandemic, what what have the full implications been? And, you know, what, what can we learn from this to go forward? And how could we do things differently going forward? And I really appreciate being touched on that. Um, is there anything more that you could share with us on, on your take on the kind of future of the potato industry in Washington state from here on out? Yeah, yeah, I'm actually gonna kind of, I think it's really all produce. So produce has one of the unique challenges that we're very seasonal, we're not necessarily a shelf stable product. So you really kind of have to have your demand mapped out so that you can grow the right amount of lettuce or potatoes or apples or what have you, so that they're always there available for the consumer. But with the closure of food service, it, and when is that gonna come back 100%? You know, you know we've already lost 12% of all the restaurants nationally, are they gonna come back? So now we're, we don't exactly know what the demand is. We're, for the past 20 years, we could always had a really good sense of what the demand was. You know, might fluctuate one or two, three, maybe 5%, but never, you know, these huge fluctuations that we've seen. And so that's really the big struggle. And I think you'll probably see some hiccups in the produce supply chain going forward, probably for the next couple of years until we get a better idea of what the consistent demand for produce is going to be. And that's really probably one of the biggest challenges. So there could be a time where yeah, there might be a shortage of something, but it's only because we're still trying to figure out demand um, and what that's gonna look like uh, all due to food service. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it's it's very clear. We're hearing from our speakers, you know, the story is not yet over, right? And there's, like you're saying, still a, a path that, that we are on and food industries, uh, food sectors, the food supply chain is on that we're still kind of riding it out. And so we just, yeah, wish you, wish for, um, some positive news and some some positive stabilization, hopefully for your industry and also, as you're saying, for other fresh produce industries, right? So this is really you're giving us an inside perspective onto something that um, multiple types of producers will will have experienced in the past year. So um, in closing, for a last question, I just want to say, you know, if the students were here with us in the room, 
oftentimes they want to say, you know, they want to ask, what, what can I do, right? Like I eat potatoes, but oh, you're right. You know, maybe I haven't been eating as many potatoes as, as normal as, or, you know, my, my, um, my regular diet has certainly been disrupted over the past year. So what can I do as a student to support farmers? And, you know, maybe you can speak specifically about potato farmers, but also thinking about produce farmers in general, as we're still in this strange and fluctuating space. What are your closing words to our students? Yeah, you know, just actually, you know, what'd be really helpful is go to a restaurant. <laughs> just, you know, get, buy, you know, whoever's open or who's ever doing takeout, um, you know, giving that type of, cust you know, purchasing, a, if you purchase at a restaurant, you're, you're helping a potato farmer in Moses Lake. Um, and so those are really the types of things that you can do. And, and, and quite frankly, we all love restaurants and they're hurting just as much as some of our farmers, actually some of them more than we are. So any type of business you can give to them actually helps us out. So we'd appreciate that. Uh, but man, keep buying those potatoes They're Like I said, they're great energy for brain energy that you need as well as physical energy, uh, highly nutritious. And if you care about our planet, you know, um, I think of potatoes because of our high yields in Washington state, it makes it an incredibly sustainable crop with a pretty low carbon footprint globally. So uh, thanks, I appreciate your time. It's always great. I wish I could be there in person and, and feel the energy of the crowd, um, but thanks for having me. And again, I'll try to answer as many questions as you guys. I'm sorry I went so long. Um, I get a little passionate when I talk about potatoes. So, but uh, look forward to maybe seeing some of you in, in, a, in a future class maybe. That's great. Thank you so much, Chris. It was a wonderful presentation, stark, um, but also incredibly engaging, you know, in terms of, of all the detail and the passion that you did bring to it. And um, I look forward to seeing the students' reflections. We'll be sure to pass some of those on to you as well as some of their questions. And again, really thank you for your time and wishing you and all farmers and also, like you're saying, the interconnection throughout the whole food supply chain really are, are food force here. We're wishing um, you and all uh, a better year. Great. Thanks. That's fun. Thank you.